Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ryan Rampersett, and today I will be talking to you about the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus. This is my fourth Galaxy phone, so it's time to begin. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO61. Well, hello everyone. It is me, Ryan. I am back again, and I am talking to you from a week after my purchase of the Galaxy S10+. Plus. I have purchased the S8, the S9, and the Note 9 over the past two and a half years, and now this is my fourth Galaxy phone, and wow, what a phone it is. Um, everything that you've read in reviews, every video that you've seen on YouTube, every podcast that has mentioned this phone, everything you've heard is probably true. That's it. That's the review. That is my second opinion. I do have a slew, though, however, of third opinions that will uh, enlighten you based on my own personal experience. Um, we will do some setup here, of course. We have to talk about uh, models, pricing, um, the the ordering process, because, again, of course, in Samsung tradition, it's different every time. And then we'll start talking about some of the interesting things about the phone itself, uh, which includes physical features and some new software features that may or may not be good. Um, and I will try my best during this review to mention some changes between the S9 and the Note 9 because I've had both fairly recently within the last year. And uh, yeah, that's the plan. Uh, so let's begin. So let's talk about pricing. This time in the wise wisdom of Apple pricing models where price creep is the standard, Samsung did it too. So this is a method in which the industry has decided that phone sales are slowing. So let's raise the average selling price of all the handsets just enough so that it looks like growth is either the same or steadily rising, even though handsets are declining in sale volume. So this year, instead of just two models, a 10 and a 10 plus, there are three, which includes the S10e, the 10 and the 10 plus. Now, respectively, these are $750, $899, and $999. These prices are a little bit steep, in my opinion. Um, one of the things that I would say about this pricing model, while it sounds good on paper to make this pricing umbrella, and in particular, this makes sense from an Android perspective where previous models of handsets do not sell well, even in the slightest. And in terms of well, I mean, nobody thinks of buying an S9 now if the S10 is available for $100 more. There's just no reason to do such a thing. So the problem that I have with this model is everybody who bought an S9 Plus, for example, last year at $850 will see that that is the price of the standard S10 now, which means they'll feel like Samsung is claiming that if that person made the same decision today, they wouldn't get the phone they had wanted originally. And in a year, prices don't climb between $50 and $100, uh, at least not from an average consumer's perspective. At least that's what my opinion is. So a lot of the grief that the pricing tiers have been given stems from the fact that we're eclipsing the uh, umbrella pattern. So, you know, we always want to have an umbrella of prices but when we start shrinking or making the umbrella bigger, we can start getting into trouble because now expectations are set and now expectations are broken when the prices creep up. But let's move on from prices. So, of course, we have a, a bunch of different colors, black, white, flamingo, and I believe there's another color, but I just couldn't figure out what it was actually called. I think it's blue of some sort. Um the base models for all of these phones, even the S10e, which is 750, they all come with 8 gigs of RAM. That's not true. The S10e comes with 6 gigs of RAM, and you can upgrade to an 8 gig uh, configuration. And the two S10 and S10 Plus model base configurations come with 8 gigs of RAM. And all models, S10e, 10, and 10 Plus, come with 128 gigs of storage. Versus the Note 9, however, this is interesting because the Note 9 is base model, $1,000. 
whereas that is the price of the S10 Plus. So it's kind of interesting. So it makes you think that the um, you know, Note 10 later this year will be about 1200 or so. Um, it's it's the, the inevitable ASP price creep syndrome now. It's just it, it, this is what happens. So my experience buying this phone was uh, slightly different than last year. Last time I purchased my Note 9 at Best Buy it was not during pre-order time, however. Before that, I did the pre-order, though, on the Samsung website for the S9 Plus. This time I did a pre-order for the S10 Plus on Best Buy's website, and I turned in my phone in person, my S9 Plus, for $550 of credit, and I paid a very hefty $508 for it. So, for a new $1,000 phone, I paid basically half price by turning in the previous year's model. Now, I'm not on any special phone plan or upgrade cycle plan or even a carrier plan. I am on no such thing. Just by turning in the previous handset was I up able to upgrade. Now, for me, this is not a big deal because I usually have two handsets, one in reserve and one active. But even if you don't have that luxury, I still think if you do agree to the Samsung cycle, you will basically have a new phone every year for half price. Um, and it's kind of, uh, kind of nice. It's kind of a good feature. So let's talk about the display. That's the newest, most pronounced thing this year. There's no notch. There's a cutout for the little cameras, though. So what's interesting is the phone display, it, it actually allegedly has the same size display as the Note 9, which is physically massive compared to this. You will have to look up the dimensions yourself, but it is massive. It is um, something I would say that is in reference to. If you remember the Nexus 6 and how wide that was, that's similar to the width of the Note 9. This phone is so skinny compared to it. It's so small compared to it. And yet it has a screen size that is equivalent. It's amazing. Now, in the display, of course, we have the cutout, but it also has some additional features that I think are notable. It has an incredible amount of brightness, 1,200 nits of brightness. It can be so visible uh, when you're outside in direct sunlight. And even when you're inside of a building and you're just by some really bright lights, you can actually see your phone just fine. It's great. And it also has this beautiful integrated under the screen fingerprint sensor. We'll talk more about that later, but it is important to notice that that is down there and it's it's down there. Of course, we maintain our um, wonderful ambient always on display. You know, I remember talking about the S9 Plus um, a year ago and commenting on how the metal band around it felt so substantial and so, I don't know if luxurious is the right word, but so industrial. Um and in some ways, in that way, luxurious. This year, they're using an aluminum band, I believe, and it is by far much less interesting. It 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 feels fine, you know. It, there's no 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 nothing great home about though. Um, so let's talk about those physical build qualities. It is much smaller. It feels like a toy compared to the Note Nine, but in terms of dimensions relative to the, to the Note S Nine Plus, it's about the same size. So year over year, you're not really creeping up in handset size. You're just creeping up in screen size, which is a pro and a con, of course, for Android, where so many things are anchored at the top of the screen. As I mentioned before, this, the, the, the metal band is just so different, and that aluminum is just so strange. The edges of this phone are extremely rounded. I mean, the, 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 the phone is a rectangle, but the edges on the display around it but even the corners are pretty curved whereas on the note there's a substantially more square edge and that's always an interesting decision and we'll see what the design language looks like on the uh, note 10 later this year of course we have to talk about the battery and we'll talk about some of the longevity details later but the note about the battery is here that it is a 4100 meh battery which is 100 more than the note however and we'll talk more about this later it remains to be seen if that makes a difference, really. In terms of battery charging, we have the usual modes, cable, wireless. Uh, you can charge with your fast chargers. You can uh, charge wirelessly with your 
power hungry chargers, you know, all the same things that you can always do. However, every reviewer on YouTube and every reviewer on every blogging website has liked to talk about this useless gimmick feature called reverse charging. It is worthless. That stops here. We're not going to talk about it. In terms of ports, you have your usual Type-C port and your usual headphone jack because Samsung likes you to hear things. In terms of speakers, we have the top front-facing stereo speaker. It's actually interesting. On the note, it was carved into the screen in some ways very similar to how the um, face uh, facing forward cameras are today through the, the pinhole. But the difference is... Last year, the, the speaker grill did not cut into the screen real estate, whereas in this year's model, there is a slight forehead, just enough forehead to safely house that little speaker grill. And of course, the bottom speaker is still down at the bottom of the phone on the right-hand side. There is no stereo speaker on the bottom. It's not like tri-stereo either. It is simply top front-facing firing forward and bottom side-facing firing outward. Buttons. Well, the buttons are sort of interesting on this phone this year. Of course, the Bixby button is still here, and it is not totally useless this time because it can be remapped. Not well, not 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 perfectly. You can remap one of two modes, either a single press or a double press, but which one ever you do not remap, the other becomes Bixby. In some ways, Bixby is useless, and we'll talk about that later, but the button, it's still there. Of course, we have the volume rockers, nothing right home about there. The buttons feel a little bit cheaper this year, in my opinion, and it's just the whole metal band thing. Instead of being whatever kind of steel it was last time, it seems that the aluminum difference might have come out. The The big difference in terms of buttons this year um, kind of come into two places. Now, there is no um, haptic force touch button under the screen where the Android home button typically goes. That's a loss because... That button was amazing to actually press. You just you just slightly depress somewhere on the front of the screen and you can instantly find out where that button is because the registration uh, of the vibration just kind of points you to it. It's great. The other kind of change here is that the power button on the right-hand side is so much higher. Uh, in fact, it's about one and a half power button lengths above where it was last time. Where my thumb naturally rests, that's where it is now. And in some ways, that's better because you could naturally rest your hand on where that button was. But now you have to just slightly stretch, which is okay, but it's just slightly something that you do have to get used to. So let's talk about something that's not so good, but quite interesting. Let's talk about the fingerprint sensor. It's under the screen. There is no longer a fingerprint sensor on the back of the phone. Did you know that? Isn't that interesting? Uh, so that what what's really interesting about this fingerprint sensor is that it reads your fingerprint with ultrasonic. For whatever that means. So on the Note, on the S9, on the S8, I've always used my two index fingers as the unlock fingers. But now, because the phone can be used front-facing, I can now use four fingers to unlock the phone. My two index fingers and my two thumbs. Having four fingerprints registered is better than the previous two from the Note 9, but it is kind of strange given the discrepancies with how often it fails to recognize. Previously, I could unlock the phone reliably with just my finger coming out of my pocket, and by the time I saw the screen, it was unlocked and I was in. Uh, this was reliable, failed very rarely, always easy to do. So now, since the scanner is in the screen, it doesn't work very well for me, consistently. When I need to um, put my finger somewhere on the front of the screen, I don't exactly know where to put my finger, because ambient display, by default, does not show a location on the front screen due to allegedly the fear of burn-in of the little fingerprint icon. Don't show the fingerprint icon. Show a little circle, maybe a little square or something, maybe like, I don't know, the Android home button. 
that's really where the fingerprint sensor should have been. Of course, that would be difficult because that's where the um, Type C pin and port is physically, but it is just slightly above where the Android home button is. If you have a dock on your Android phone, imagine the top of the dock sort of being where the fingerprint sensor is. And because you don't get to know on the on on the uh, always on display where to put your finger, you will almost certainly miss and wonder why isn't it going? Why isn't it going? Why isn't it going? Oh, I'm too high. Okay, and then you just keep trying and eventually you get it. Now, sometimes it works just fine. But other times it does not. Now, I can go through a day where I have to unlock my phone or I have to try to unlock three or four times in a row for my fingerprint to get actually recognized. Now, according to many people on the Reddit forums and others around the internet, on Twitter and elsewhere, if you register your finger, the same finger specifically, multiple times, you were get, you're get you able to get better results, more reliability, because it will have more possible matches in surface area. That's great, but the problem with that is I already have four fingers registered. So if any of if there are any cons of the phone, while beautiful, the fingerprint technology for under the screen uh, authentication just might be not quite there yet, in my opinion. Now, on the other hand, many people are getting just fine results from this, so it may be that my handset is slightly different. It might be that my hands are slightly different. Or it might be that I don't know how to use fingerprints effectively on a phone screen. I don't know. There's another uh, related thing to this that we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's a certain new mode set. So now there's an addition to, um, you know, just hitting the haptic button to kind of wake up the phone like we used to do on the previous models. Now there's double tap and there's lift to wake. And so those two modes are something we'll talk about later. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> Let's talk about the camera. There are three cameras on the back and two on the front. Uh, the three cameras on the back are the 2X camera, the 1X camera, and the half X camera, otherwise known as the telephoto lens. And let me tell you, the new lens is absolutely wonderful. I was just at a really fun event over the last week, I was in a big crowd and I wanted to get a really big group picture. And, you know, when you're doing big group pictures, you have to tell everybody, scoot in, scoot in, get closer. Well, this crowd was a bunch of people and we didn't have time to do all that. So all I did was I stood up, held my phone in the sky, switched into telephoto mode and took a picture. And it was easily able to capture the entire scene just fine. So the new mode is very appreciated. I really have no idea why that 2X camera is even in the phone at this point. It does absolutely nothing for me ever. Because if I need to zoom in on something, if it's not close enough for 1X, 2X is barely going to cut it. So digital zoom is the only way to go at that point. This could have been a cheaper handset if the camera hadn't been there, probably. Now, on the S10e, that is the case. Only the 1X camera, the regular camera, and the half X camera are um, available on the, on the S10e. So it is cheaper for that reason. But they could have done it uniformly. Now, I'll tell you a story about the uh, camera results, though. They're inconclusive so far after a week. Um, you know, the pictures look fine. They are not noticeably different or better than I, what I think I was seeing on the Note and the S9. Still better than, of course, the S8, but no big deal there. And it's probably still actually better than the S9. But the difference that I think I see is that they're just a little bit softer. So I've turned off scene optimization. I've turned off some other modes. I have not seen much difference. They just look soft. So... There are also two cameras on the front. I have no idea what one of the cameras does. It, they don't matter to me. I've I don't take pictures 
uh, with the front cameras very often. I only really use them for video calls. And if they weren't there, that beautiful pole punch camera wouldn't have to be there. So the notable features of the camera are that I'm sure there are some, but whatever they are, I'm not using them. So go listen to a YouTube camera guy to find out more. Uh, here in my list of notes, I have a spec sh specs sheet. Um, what's fun about the spec sheet is that we're using a Snapdragon 855 with 8 gigs of RAM. Now, the reason that's interesting is because the Note 9 had 6 gigs of RAM, and you could upgrade, of course, to the 8 gig model somehow by paying a fortune, but I refuse to do so. So, this phone, just 8 months later, is superior in specs which is ridiculous in my opinion. Of course, every model here comes with 128 gig standard of storage, and I added a 128 gig SD card, micro SD of course, from Amazon for only $20 to this phone. What is storage and why do I need it? The answer is I basically don't. At this point, there is no amount of content that I can put on this thing that I myself will ever use. I don't watch movies, I don't watch videos, I don't do anything. But the phone has an adequate amount of storage forever. So let's talk about Android and the operating system. Wow, Android, what has happened to you? You know, Samsung has had a rough time with user interfaces. You know, back in the old days, TouchWiz was uh, uh, an abomination. And Samsung was the laughing stock of the industry. And that's when we all fell in love with stock UI. You know, Holo with Ice Cream Sandwich and then later Material Design with Lollipop. These design experiences were far and above the most uniform, but also pleasing to look at. Now, Samsung Experience was the successor to uh, TouchWiz. And the Samsung experience wasn't actually that bad. It was actually just okay. Everything looked okay. It was very modern. There was plenty of decoration, but not um, overly saturated decoration. It has been replaced with this strange, bloated, awful interface. And so maybe this is me getting used to Samsung experience and even saying that in some ways material design is deficient in the face of what Samsung had previously made. But now the one UI, the new UI that Samsung makes their, for their phones, has replaced the Samsung experience, and it draws heavily off of the Android Pie uh, design language that's sort of, sort of, sort of, kind of, maybe, kind of, related to Material Design 2. Uh, but regardless, nothing really looks that great in terms of design, for example, list items, you can see this most prominently in the settings menu, are often smushed cards or elongated pills for almost no reason. Now, one of the best things about One UIs, for example, though, is Samsung's uh, realization that most default screens serve no purpose. Um, so what are we going to do with them? So in the old days, you might see... You might go into your settings menu and you might uh, you might want to start scrolling or you hit something at the top of the screen. So if you're single-handed, though, it might be a stretch to reach all the way up to hit the Wi-Fi button at the top of the screen in the settings menu. Well, what if we could somehow uniformly and within design reason push everything down to just about thumb height? Well, the solution is let's make the headers gigantic. Now, to be honest, I was skeptical that this would work or even make sense, but it actually does make sense. The header pushes all of the content down, and when you start scrolling, the header collapses into a single word that goes side by side with the search bar and your own personal icons, and now you just get to scroll like normal. Works out really well. Simple. The contacts, the phone app, and many other Samsung apps are following this One UI design paradigm, which works out really well. But man, it just looks terrible in other places. The um, very strange list item views, they have almost no padding around them. It looks awkward to say the least on especially this wraparound screen where there is no edge and you just see these shapes kind of fall off into the distance. 
that's not even to even talk about what it looks like when you look at the notification tray or these awful buttons for the um, quick toggles. They're just circles with little icons in them, and they no longer have the beautiful little animations that they used to have. And that's it's just kind of a shame. And of course, all of this UI is white by default. And hey, what was that about an AMOLED screen? The single best screen in the world relative to darkness because when the pixels aren't lit up, there's no power usage. And so Amalog, AMOLED chuckles in the distance at the joke that Samsung has played on themselves. The, 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 the last part about uh, that I'll say here about the Samsung experience change to One UI is that all of the utility is pretty much still there. So everything from edge lighting to uh, ambient display capabilities, that's all still there. Speaking of which, that's exactly what we're going to talk about next. One of the things that up were, that was updated in Android Pie was the new launcher, specifically the new app switcher. So instead of doing the absurd thing, which is to have all of the apps in a vertical column where you could never see a full apps preview, they have switched to the more logical and much more consistent left to right view where the most recent app is slightly to the left and the lot most recently used apps after that is slightly to the right and so on but they're not stacked in any way they're just in a left to right list which is wonderful now by default it will not center on the current app it will center on the previously used app which means if you just want if you were programmed over the last three generations of samsung experience to manually do the switch to swipe a little bit well now that that habit that you've built up over the last few years, it's gone and now it's replaced with drudgery because you have to undo what you've learned. One of the new features, of course, besides some of the Android Pie features themselves, is Rise to Wake. Now, this sounds beautiful. The idea is that when you bring your phone up, either the uh, insecure face unlock feature will unlock your phone because it's awake now, or you can uh, maybe see the time, see your notifications, and then when it's on the lock screen itself, you can sort of see the fingerprint button by default. So you're good to go. But here's the problem. It is so sensitive that if you touch your phone just to move it on the table, not even to pick it up, not even to lift it, but just to rotate it so that you, you don't spill your Diet Coke can, uh, while recording a podcast, even if you do that, it will wake up. And what it will try to do next is to, if you have face unlock on, it will try to look for you. And what it will do after that is say it can't find you. And then what it will do then is later, when it's in your pocket, it will think, oh, I've been lifted. I'm going to wake up now. I can't see you. Oh, I'm going to wake up now. Uh, I can't see you. Oh, I'm going to wake up now. I can't see you. And over and over and over. And eventually... Your phone will say, hey, I, I've been woken up like 40 times. Can you use your fingerprint to wake me up now? I have no idea what's going on. Rise to Wake is too sensitive, and I don't think yet there is a way to tune its sensitivity, which means that I have turned it off to see if this makes the reliability of not only the front fingerprint sensor better, but just the phone's capability to stay sort of asleep when I'm not really interacting with it. I'm just moving it around as a thing on the table rather than a phone that I want to use. Now, on the other hand, there is a different feature called Double Tap to Wake. Now, this feature was amazing back in the day when certain phones had this and it was revolutionary. Having your phone know that it was being touched somehow. Now, I've, I've actually used this quite a few times. If you just want to see a notification that's on the notification screen, the lock screen, in other words, this is an easy way to get to it. It's simple. It's fine. Now, the ambient always on display, it is still here. It has a, a few tweaks, though. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. So it is still present, of course, and it is still configurable. There are numerous clock options. And, of course, you can download more from the Samsung store if you really want to. However, in Pi, apparently, 
somebody decided to put icons in color, which means I have no idea what any of these icons mean anymore. And the icon coloring is usually a solid color background in a slightly different solid color uh, interior shape. So I, and I have no idea even what the icon is. There's someone, some red icon that appears on the Man display now. And I don't know if it's email from Gmail or what, but it's there and I see it and I have no idea what it is. It's just too hard to see in color. There's no value added. And it was just so much more sleek to see it just sort of in black and white um, in that silhouette shape. And it was very discreet that way. And now the color sort of ruins that. Uh, it's kind of a bummer. This could have been done, though, to sort of uh, more evenly wear the pixels that make up the phone's AMOLED display. So instead of just wearing out those um, brighter white pixels, let's wear out some of the, more of the colors more evenly. I don't know if that's how it works, but uh, that's annoying. You know, another interesting thing I noticed is that the sound's changed. So after two years with the Samsung Experience sounds, well, the sounds are different now. So now all of my little ringtone things and all of my little text tone things, they're all different. And so over the past week, I've been getting messages and calls, and I have no idea whose phone it is. Eventually, it's my phone, it turns out, and I still don't know what I got, and it is hilarious. You know, other noticeable features that are removed I mean, what else could be more noticeable than the lack of the S Pen from the Note 9? Do you know how many times in the last week I thought, hey, you know what? I don't have a piece of paper, but I really want to show this person I'm talking to a little diagram. I'll just pull up my phone. Oh, no, I don't have the pen anymore. So it turns out I am addicted to a useless stylus in a phone that I only use maybe twice a week. But the moment you have the capability to pull out a pen and start drawing on the screen is the moment you have unlocked a new capability with your phone. And it turns out it is a wonderful capability to show somebody a diagram. Now, of course, you can draw on your phone, but there's nothing as good as having that little pen. And I will mention one other thing about the software features here. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's okay that the face unlock feature is insecure, but it's not okay that it has been un in insecure for the last, I don't know, S8, S9, Note 9, and yet nobody really made a big deal about it at any of those points in time. But now, for some reason, the face unlock is so insecure that we have to make a big deal about it. Did you know that the iris scanner was removed? Well, I did know that, and I never used the iris scanner in the previous phone that I had, the Note 9, either. So, you know, turns out in Minnesota, where it is winter frequently, especially around this time of year, it's not always easy to use your fingerprint to unlock your phone. When I do travel, though, I do turn face unlock off. And so what if somebody can get into my phone? What are you going to do about it? You still can't get into anything else. It still requires fingerprint unlock for everything internally. It's okay. It's not that bad. Uh, so we're going to talk about the battery life now. And after that, we're going to talk about the signal strength. So the battery life on this phone should be either the same or better than the Note that it replaces because the Note had a similar size screen, a smaller battery, and it probably had a little bit more uh, powerful processor, or at least a more um, more inefficient processor, either being older or just being clocked higher, because that's what the Note line is all about. Well, in my experience, the S10 has had somewhat of a mediocre battery life. Now, that's not to say that I don't get to about 30% when I'm done with my day, and I mean from 6.30 a.m. to about 11.30 p.m. That's my day usually, and I get to about 30% battery life. That's great, but I kind of expected more. I always see these big drops in battery life. So in the mornings, you know, I'll always read the news, Hacker News, Reddit, some tweets, and so on, and I'll get down to 96, 95, 94%, 
on the Note 9, but now I'm getting down to 89% in the morning, and I'm kind of worried. So I don't know what factors go into that. Now, the phone has only been used for a week, so its battery algorithm still might be too, getting tuned internally, but I'm still slightly spooked about it. Now, again, the battery life should still be somewhat better because the battery is new, the cycles have not gone on for very long, and Samsung has historically over-provisioned their batteries just a little bit so that in two years, only 10% or so has degraded, whereas uh, a different phone might have more degradation. Now, we'll see how the battery changes over time here, and so far, I am somewhat skeptical of its long-term durability because I see these big drops just all the time, and I don't know if there are app differences. I use the same apps, phone over phone. I don't know if it's an Android Pie thing. I don't know if it's a One UI thing. Something is different enough, though, to cause a seemingly higher than average battery drain, but I just don't know what it is yet. I'll tell you about a different thing which might be correlated, and that is the signal strength on this phone. Now, I have T-Mobile. T-Mobile in the metro area of Minnesota, the Twin Cities, also known as St. Paul in Minneapolis, where I live and work. This area is surprisingly good for T-Mobile. Pretty much everywhere I personally go has decent coverage. Now, however, on the second floor of where I work, that zone is notoriously poor for T-Mobile connectivity. However, on my old phone, even though that sometimes T-Mobile would get a little bit slow, and of course I was doing air quotes there, it was okay, it was acceptable. I could get enough to LTE to do any individual task and it was no problem. But in the last week, I've noticed that I've had to walk over to the windows to get LTE reception, whereas frequently I would only have 3G or no G reception while sitting at my physical desk in my chair. Wow, that is annoying. I've noticed elsewhere while traveling that in the last week or so that, wow, you know, I've been here before and I've never had a, I've never even gave it a single thought that I wasn't connected to LTE, which means I most likely was. But this time I noticed that it was slow and I noticed that I was on 3G. I don't know if T-Mobile has made changes. I don't know if the bands are different in this phone, but something seems different about how the signal quality is with the S10 Plus than with the uh, Note 9. Now, I will say that the S9 Plus that I bought in 2018 in February, that phone in particular had one of the strongest signals I've ever seen. Now, for the last two and a half years, I've worked in the same office and I was, at that point, taking the elevator every day. And I would always, you know, Google something, of course, on the elevator. And I always was surprised when I had an LTE connection inside of the building, in the middle of the building, in an elevator, I always had an LTE connection on the S9+. Plus. It was a little bit less good with the Note 9. And on this phone, it just has no clue what's going on, on when I'm in an elevator. So. It's an interesting difference, an interesting trade-off. You get this the most beautiful phone you've ever seen with this new luxurious uh, aluminum band and edge-to-edge -edge screen, but you also lose some battery certainty and maybe you lose some signal reliability. I don't know, it's interesting. We just I just don't know enough yet about what the quirks are. Let's conclude this episode with a section on upgrades. So you can upgrade from an S8, and I think you will enjoy this phone immensely. You're getting a new camera. The wide angle lens will blow you away. You're getting new screen tech. The cutout for the front facing cameras, not a big deal. You'll actually really love that they've taken the edges and tapered them even further. So it's no longer so extreme. You're getting additional battery capacity. The S8 was good, but this phone is better despite the battery problems that I've reported and experienced so far. And no matter what, you are 
at least able to return your S8 in at least some condition to get store credit or if not trade in credit, which could always be nice. And if not, at least you're recycling your phone, right? Now, let's say you're coming from a different phone. So maybe a phone older than the S8. Maybe you're coming from a different vendor's phone. I don't know what drew you to those vendors, but if you are interested in the latest flagship, for whatever reason, the next flagship will be the Pixel in the fall and maybe the Note 10 around the same time. Either way, these are your choices. These are the phones to get. Now, if you're looking for, uh, to, to go from an iPhone to the S10, there are some things to consider. You are giving up, of course, the ecosystem that you've loved for years, but you're also giving up some of the, um, you know, inherent um, uniformity that is present in the iPhone and iOS lineup. Now, the iPhone XS and XI Max are great, but if you're coming from an older iPhone that doesn't have the beautiful display that the X series does, you will love the S10's display because instead of having that awful home button on the bottom, which was iconic, but now looks ancient in comparison to how the 10 looks from either company, ironically, you will be very surprised. It is kind of funny how Samsung has had this beautiful front, this clean front display for so much longer than, than Apple has had uh, their 10 series available. So in short, any upgrade that you can come from, you will certainly enjoy that upgrade. Now, should you buy it outright? Yeah, probably, if you can, that's always good. If you can do a trade-in, even better. If you do need to finance, that's fine. Keep in mind, this phone, it's expensive. It is a $1,000 base model. You can creep up to more than $1,500 if you want additional customizations. But no matter what you do, you will enjoy that. So that's it. That's the review of the S10 Plus. As always, thank you for listening. This has been Second Opinion 61. Of course, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO61. And of course, you can find me, Ryan Rampersad, just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at RyanMar, and of course, on my website, RyanRampersad.com. You can follow us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the nexus tv and you can leave comments for us at reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv thanks for listening and have a good one the nexus the nexus the nexus tv podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence, convergence.